This panel is on the American University Public and Private, um, and we have a very distinguished lineup for you. Um, Kate Stith Cabranis has been introduced at this function so many times that I think it would be superfluous to talk about her um, distinguished position and degrees and things. I will say she was the moving spirit on our committee organizing these academic panels and figuring out what would be interesting and helpful um, to talk about. And so I, I was very grateful for her role in that. She is also the only veteran or recidivist, if you will, of these celebrations of the Dartmouth College case. Um, she participated, obviously, in the 175th anniversary presentation. And I will say that her kind of account of the case um, that she did for that, I think, was the introduction for a number of us to what the Dartmouth College case was all about and how to think about it. So if, if you become convinced that any of the rest of us are, are getting things wrong, um, chances are it's Kate's fault. Um, <laughs> Annette Gordon-Reed is the, the Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard Law School, or the Harvard Law School, as we are always trained to say, um, and Professor of History at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. She won the Pulitzer Prize in History for her work on Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Um, but most important, obviously, she is a member of the Dartmouth class of 1981. Um, and then David Raban is the Dar Jamail, Rander Hage Jamail, and Robert Lee Jamail Regents Chair at the University of Texas, which I think sounds a little better than offspring of Joe Jamail chair at the <laughs> University of Texas. Um, he is probably the, the most careful legal historian that I know personally, um, but he's also an authority in the law of higher education and a former general counsel of the American Association of University Professors. Um, but most important, obviously, he is the person that hired me for my first real teaching job um, <laughs> at the University of Texas. So you can take that into account in, in assessing whether he's a person of judgment or not. But it is a real pleasure to have him at Dartmouth. So without further ado, um, we'll start with Kate stith -Cabranis. Uh, 25 years ago, when we celebrated the case or commemorated it in Washington, I spoke about its modern implications for private and public universities. And this time, I thought I'd go back in time and look at its implications in the 19th century. Um, as noted yesterday, just a short walk from here, sheltered by Webster Hall's portico, a bronze plaque reads, founded by Eliezer Wheelock, refounded by Daniel Webster. The inscription commemorates the decision's pivotal role in our college's survival. The case's transformational impact extends far beyond Hanover. Before 1819, American common law jurisprudence did not uniformly answer the question whether privately founded and funded charitable institutions were public and thus could be subject to basically plenary legislative oversight or private and even if they were private, it was unclear what this implied as to the power of the state to alter the institution or to regulate it. For instance, in 1790, the Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals rejected the Commonwealth's efforts to alter aspects of the College of William and Mary. The Virginia court held that William and Mary is a private and not a public institution because it was founded with mere charitable institutions, that Virginia had subsequently added bounty, quote, did not change the nature of the college, nor did it matter that William and Mary's purpose was something the public cared about, education. The Virginia Supreme Court's 1790 decision noted in passing that colleges and hospitals are often classed together as private and are subject to the will of the founder. But some subsequent cases in other states would classify similar colleges as public. This was the view unanimously adopted, of course, by the New Hampshire's highest court in the first stage of the Dartmouth College case. <clears throat> the court explained that a corporation serving public purposes could be either private or public, depending on whether the charter conferred property rights and beneficial interests um, to the incorporators. And Dartmouth College, everybody agreed. It had a public purpose. It was founded for the education and instruction 
of the youth and Indian tribes and also of English youth. But New Hampshire's highest court said the trustees had no private beneficial interest in either the franchise or the property of the college. Indeed, New Hampshire's court had the Dartmouth trustees as fiduciaries of a public corporation who were ipso facto officers of the state. Of course, when the case reached the Supreme Court, the justices rejected the conclusion that Dartmouth was a public institution. Marshall's opinion was arguably narrow, limited to publicly chartered eleemosynary institutions. <clears throat> uh, he came down essentially where Virginia's Supreme Court had come down in 1790, although that was not a constitutional decision. Because of its private founding and funding, the institution was private even though publicly chartered and serving public ends. <clears throat> um, but Justice Story, in his concurring opinion, made clear that the court was liberating all private corporations, Elio Monsonary and commercial. In Story's view, only where a corporation's whole interest in franchises were the exclusive property and domain of the government could the government regulate, control, and direct the corporation. We've We've talked about, in the last panel, about the significance of that in subsequent American history. <clears throat> uh, economic historian Adam Winkler uh, last year published a book called We the Corporations, where he said the Dartmouth College case fundamentally reconceived the nature of the American corporation. <clears throat> uh, but this usual assessment of the case, focusing on private corporations, overlooks what may be another significant consequence of the decision. Marshall's opinion explicitly acknowledged for the first time in the Supreme Court a particular type of corporation, what he called private eleemosynary corporations, and we now call private charitable corporations. Um, uh, Ernie, Ernie and Young in the last panel referred uh, to these. These private institutions were, in Marshall's word, artificial entities. <clears throat> uh, the idea of an artificial person was not new, but <clears throat> I posit that in constitutionalizing this concept, the Supreme Court provided a legal pathway for private educational entities and other charitable corporations, newly insulated from government interference, interference by the Dartmouth College case, to claim civil rights, many of the same rights bestowed by the Constitution on natural persons. The potential civil rights significance of the Dartmouth College case, now largely overlooked, was recognized by Justice Story himself in a later private letter to legal scholar and jurist Chancellor James Kent of New York. Story expressed his hope that the Dartmouth decision would shield all non-state institutions and would check any encroachments upon their civil rights, which the passions and popular doctrines of the day may stimulate our state legislatures to enact. Now you're thinking um, state legislatures enacting debtor relief laws, but Story was making a broader point, and I will try to do so today. The idea that private colleges could pursue education as their private leaders chose, uh, was important, but it was a double-edged proposition. It was double-edged because on the one hand, the decision meant private colleges were empowered to discriminate against virtually any idea or group with impunity, including discriminate on religious and racial grounds. But on the other hand, the decision meant these very marginalized groups and minority groups <clears throat> might be able to, and in fact were able to, establish educational institutions free from state interference, institutions that would serve them. And I'm talking here about women, Catholics, and African Americans. The legacy of the Dartmouth College case in fostering the interests of discrete groups deserves the attentions of scholars and students of American history. This morning we don't have time to cover all of these specifics, so I'm gonna focus in on just one, the history of colleges established in the 19th century for the education of African Americans, the institutions that today we refer to as historically black colleges and universities. Understand, 
Before the Civil War, rate, uh, slavery and segregation categorically foreclosed educational opportunities for nearly all black Americans, though a couple of institutions of higher learning for black students were founded <clears throat> before the Civil War in Pennsylvania and Ohio. When the Civil War ended, 94% of the American black population lived in the former Confederacy. Emancipation had not materially improved their educational opportunities. Even the newly ratified 14th Amendment did little to help. <clears throat> the Dartmouth College case, by endowing private colleges with certain rights of private persons, um, <clears throat> had the effect of placing private colleges beyond the reach of the 14th Amendment's promise of due process and equal protection of the law. <clears throat> 14th Amendment rights like individual rights guaranteed in the Bill of Rights, afforded protection only from state action, action by a state legislature, state agency, state employee. Akilah Morris told you the 14th Amendment was all about reigning in the states. The 14th Amendment did not directly reach private action. As late as 1962, courts cited and quoted the Dartmouth College case in upholding private universities' denial of admission to students of color solely on the basis of their race. In that year, for instance, a federal court, federal court in Louisiana held that Tulane University was private within the meaning of the Dartmouth College case because of its private sources of funding. And because it was a private institution, the racial discrimination practiced by Tulane was not, quote, the action of the state of Louisiana. Now, to be sure, Congress, pursuant to its legislative powers over interstate commerce and over federal funding, might, and two years later would, prohibit racial discrimination by certain private entities, including private colleges. But the 14th Amendment did not do so directly by its terms, because these were private corporations and understood, as Ernie mentioned, uh, to be insulated from state regulation by the basic holding of Dartmouth College. With the end of the Civil War, public education in the former Confederacy grew significantly. While the North had developed public primary and secondary education beginning in the 17th century, the South had not established public schools. White businessmen and farmers had clamored for public schools, <clears throat> but faced class-based resistance. Um, that began to change after the Civil War. <clears throat> But however divided white Southerners might have been over public education for whites, they were united in their opposition to educational opportunities for their black neighbors. The historian Henry Drury details how white opposition expressed itself in ways ranging from legislative inaction to violent attacks on white teachers of black students to the destruction of nascent black school buildings. <clears throat> Even as they began to fund public schools, Southern and some border state legislatures denied public support for the education of any black citizens. <clears throat> uh, now, <clears throat> at the same time these uh, developments are happening in the South, Congress is also taking action. In fact, during the Civil War in 1862, Congress passed the first Moral Land Grant Act which provided federal lands for states to create liberal and practical educational institutions, our land-grant colleges. 69 of them were quickly founded throughout the United States. The Morrill Act, implemented mostly after the Civil War, was a boon for white Americans in the South. For most black Americans, however, the first Morrill Act did not exist in any practical sense. The white Southerners who controlled their states' legislatures and distributed resources made available by the Morrill Act refused to spend them on black education, just as they refused to appropriate state revenues to support education for black citizens. Eventually, Congress responded to the discriminatory use of federal funds by Southern legislatures. In 1890, it passed the second Morrill Act, which required as a condition of federal support the admission of black students to existing uh, land-grant universities or the creation of separate and just educational facilities for them. The benefits of the Second Moral Act were quite limited in the former Confederacy. <clears throat> uh, there was insufficient federal oversight and enforcement, and the act essentially codified the illusory and denigrating concept of separate but equal. Um, 
Even after the Second Morrill Act then, the hostility of state legislatures in the South to public education for blacks made private education, private education, their most important option. For decades after the Civil War, the Dartmouth College case, I submit, played a beneficent role in expanding the civil and educational rights of black Americans. No historian seems to have connected the Dartmouth College decision <coughs> to the rise of historically black colleges and universities after the Civil War. That said, several scholars have recognized that these colleges existed, could exist, precisely because they were private institutions. The historian uh, Drury confirms that the widespread opposition to higher education for black citizens during this period suggests why the private and not the public sector took the lead in providing black education. Another scholar of historically black colleges and universities, Kristen Brody, agrees that, quote, African Americans in southern states relied on private colleges as they were prohibited from attending white institutions, public or private. So this is my argument. Almost immediately after it was decided, the Dartmouth College case came to stand for the proposition that private corporations, specific private L.A. Monsonary institutions, were significantly shielded from state government interference. I have various cases quoting Maryland in 1860 saying precisely that, Maryland Supreme Court. Decades later, this understanding provided space for black Americans to pursue higher education in a hostile South, especially between 1862, the Emancipation Proclamation, and 1890, the Second Moral Act, Southern blacks and their supporters embraced the private corporate form given constitutional protection by the Dartmouth College decision, the very constitutional doctrine used by others to deny them admission to some private colleges and universities. They used as a tool for advancement of human dignity. This was no mean feat. The harsh legacy of slavery imposed enormous obstacles to progress by black Americans after the Civil War. As I noted, 94% of the nation's black population lived in the South. Not surprisingly, 90% of black Southerners, only recently emancipated, were illiterate due to a variety of prohibitions against educating enslaved persons. <clears throat> Undeterred, Northern Freedmen societies, religious missionary groups, black Southern communities, assisted by the Freedmen's Bureau, created by Congress in 1865, worked to charter private schools for the education of black Americans, many of which started out as primary and secondary education uh, and later evolved into private higher education. Uh, in this way, the development of these schools paralleled Dartmouth's. B viewed in the broad sweep of history, Dartmouth College grew out of Eliezer Wheelock's non-chartered Moore's Charity School a secondary school that continued to exist for some years after Dartmouth College began admitting students. So only a few years after Appomattox, private charitable corporations, an idea fostered and embraced in the Dartmouth College decision, had transformed the educational horizon of black Americans. Between 1866 and 1870, the Freedmen's Bureau didn't exist very long, and there were subsequent developments, but in those years, the number of black private educational institutions, including uh, pre-college institutions, increased in the United States as a whole from 740 to 2,677. An 1870 report by the Freedmen's Bureau listed 95 advanced schools and colleges for black students. That's a quote, meaning high schools and colleges. <clears throat> Almost all of them in the southern states. Some of the most famous and prestigious privately historically black colleges and universities were established during this period, including Shaw University in North Carolina in 1865, Fisk University in Tennessee in 1866, and Howard University in the District of Columbia in 1867. The historian Reginald Wilson underscores that black private colleges beyond the reach of prejudiced state governments continued to, quote, carry the substantial responsibility of educating blacks at the college level until the 1930s. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so there is uh, some uncertainty as to uh, 
the exact role of the Dartmouth College case uh, here with respect to these colleges. And I'm also studying women's colleges and, and the great growth in Catholic colleges. Um, it's true that state governments picking up on Story's caveat in his concurring opinion um, generally adopted a reserve clause, which Caleb Nelson has spoken about, uh, which said all future charters or incorporations pursuant to statute or charter are um, subject to future legislative modification. But I have been able to find in the historical record no evidence that the southern states used this reserve legislative power that they exercised it with respect to black colleges and universities established in the wake of the Civil War. Southern legislatures seem to have basically ignored these schools as if to take no responsibility for them to, and deny uh, their existence, whereas trying to get involved with them uh, presented its own problem for <clears throat> uh, white legislatures. Now, we know that America's higher education institutions have grown and evolved dramatically since the 1930s, not to mention since the Dartmouth College case in 1819. But the case clearly insisted on a constitutional distinction between public and private college. So I disagree with some historians who say, oh, that didn't arise until the Morrill Act and after the Civil War. Now, it was an idea whose full significance was probably uncertain when the case was decided. And the distinction, I would submit, between public and private education is even more blurred today when public and private funds support virtually all US colleges and universities. And various laws, non-discrimination, and other laws, state and federal, apply equally to all such institutions. Indeed, Judge Henry Friendly, whom I mentioned yesterday in his 1986 lecture at Dartmouth, commemorating the sesquicentennial of Daniel Webster's argument, famously subtitled his lecture, The Public-Private Penumbra. What's a penumbra? I don't know, it's a conundrum, it's something. Is it really exist? My claim today is small, but I don't think it's been made before. It appears that the idea of the private charitable educational institution played an important role in the aftermath of the Civil War when newly emancipated black Americans needed and ardently sought education and were denied access to white institutions and to public support. So let me just summarize. Our traditional appreciation of the Dartmouth case uh, is somewhat siloed. Uh, yes, the case played, uh, we founded Dartmouth College, as the plaque at Webster Hall says. Of greater national significance, of course, it contributed to the transformation of the American corporate-driven economy. But also this, by creating and protecting the category of private eleemosynary institutions, the Dartmouth College decision had important implications for the later struggle to secure the civil rights of black Americans in ways that even Justice Story probably didn't fully imagine. The Dartmouth College case helped us to overcome undue encroachment on civil rights that our state legislatures might time to time try to impose. I'm very happy to be here today. I, the other part of my Dartmouth life was being a, on the member of the Board of Trustees who happened to be meeting across the way right there and I came off in June so I have this sort of impulse to sort of be there and see, see them and, and get into all of that again. And I'm apolog I have apologies for not being able to be here last night uh, to hear uh, the recreation of the iconic case, but I'm happy to be here with you this morning to talk about the American University, public and private. This is a broad topic, and my comments are broad. Uh, some of the things themes have been sounded earlier today in the first panel, and some by Kate just now. When I first read the Dartmouth College case in law school, and I've thought about it since, it was mainly in connection with its important role in the creation of the modern corporation. The idea that when a 
private contract is made, not just private contracts, but any contract is made that cannot be impaired by the state. And what this did for the creation of private business corporations, it established a general principle of non-regulation. Now we in the modern state have regulation, but it's always spoken of as something that is unusual or as something that is problem, inherently problematic and should be limited. So the case had an enormous influence on the development of the country necessarily with the rise of business corporations. And there was some concern mentioned this morning about how people feel about that because people have, you know, ambivalent feelings about corporations. And yes, the NAACP is a corporation, but it's not Exxon. It's not uh, a co commercial entity. It's uh, an entity that started, these entities started as being for the benefit of the public and a different understanding about that. And there was suspicion about the corporate form because it limited liability of individuals. And we move from that to a period where it's not about the um, the benefit of the public, it's for shareholder interest. So there's sort of a different standing that the corporation has now. Uh, and we look back to the beginning of the protection of it from the Dartmouth College case. And then, as was mentioned in the history earlier, that there was a period of ambivalence about that. Once we get to the Jacksonian era, it's not seen as something that was so wonderful as you're thinking about uh, the rise of the, the common man against what people would have thought were special interests. So the case had another influence that we're addressing in this particular panel, and that is in the rise of private colleges, the private entity, uh, um, private entities that educate people. And the thinking was that once people understood that a new college or an entity that was put in place could not be interfered with by outsiders, namely the state, that encouraged people to set them up, as Kate suggested. And it encouraged donors to become involved with them and to, to think, look to the interests of these entities because their values could be, they could be assured that they would not be trampled upon by the state. So this freed people to create these institutions, and you see a rise of, of them uh, during the 19th century. This common understanding has been, had been sort of trumpeted in the literature for many years, and, but there was one person, or a number of people, and I'm gonna sp focus on one individual, who challenged this idea in a very interesting forum for the Journal of Education John C. Whitehead mounted a vigorous challenge to this notion that the Dartmouth College case was this iconic case and represents a break with the past in terms of education in the United States. Before and after the case, he says, states were involved in what were considered to be private institutions. Dartmouth, even after the case came down, continued to seek a relationship with the state of New Hampshire, as a matter of fact. They, had, they provided for representation on the board uh, of, a, of a member of the state of New Hampshire, and that continues to, th to this day in exchange for uh, resources. There was no, I guess the point is that there was no such thing as a completely private institution. And even today, there are just there are only a handful of institutions that could be, you know, uh, educational institutions of higher education, a higher the higher levels that can be considered totally private. There's always been a hybrid, and so it raises the question of what is a private institution versus a public institution. Now, the fight at Dartmouth was really about religion to religious factions over who was going to be the head of a church, of the white church. So there was a component of it that was local and specific and an intimate problem that necessarily, once the case came down, had a larger significance and out, took it outside of the context of this private dispute. It was also a political question because 
there was a dispute between Federalists and sort of Republicans during this time period. So these local political issues have this, you have this controversy and there's a resolution of it that nevertheless has a widespread application. Even with that, Dartmouth continued to want to be connected to the state of New, of New Hampshire. Other denominational churches, I mean schools, continued to want some connection with the state for resources. So there was no real private entity here. And that was Whitehead's point, is that Dartmouth does not represent a break between something that was totally different before and then something totally different happens afterwards. There's a continuation of this idea that even private colleges will have some connection to the state. So he didn't see the case as making any big claim. Jürgen Herbst, in the same form, form strikes back and says, no, it really did change things because it crystallized, it made people think about the differences between public and private. And what the even if there were these instances where there, were co where there was cooperation between the state and these colleges, the primary understanding was that there would be non-interference. The presumption of non-interference would hold in these situations even though there was some cooperation, and states kind of took a handoff attitude about all of this. So the two go back and forth on this and come to the conclusion that perhaps both of them are right. And they move a little bit to the side. Maybe that, you know, uh, Whitehead says, well, maybe I had stated my, uh, state, stated my claim that the case was not very important, was overstrong. Uh, Herbst sort of suggests, well, maybe my understanding uh, that it was pivotal, uh, that this is a timing question, that it's before this, whether all of this happens before the Civil War or after the Civil War, but they come to some agreement that the case was, in fact, important. That it, and it, this chief importance is to get us to think about chief importance in terms of education, not the corporation. The, the issue of the, the modern corporation, but in the rise of education is to get us to think about what is private and what is public in these particular contexts. On that point, almost a third of students today are in what could be considered to be private institutions, like Dartmouth and others in my institution of Harvard where I teach. We recognize these as private schools, although and they're also, the, we consider there are for-profit schools as well, but these are private schools that we consider out of the control of the government. Well, most people think of it, that that's the first thing you would say is the difference between a public institution and a private institution. But as was mentioned before, these institutions cannot exist without government support, financial aid, that's given to students, allows colleges to charge tuitions that they probably could not charge if, uh, but for the existence of this kind of support. And that's a very important thing. Uh, endowments, only recently now, of course, we know as uh, laws passed to tax the endowments of very, very wealthy schools, but before, for the most part, schools that, private schools endowments are not taxed in a way that they could be taxed, and that's a form of a subsidy that the government has given uh, to, uh, to, to these colleges. As Kate mentioned before, anti-discrimination laws that suggest that if you take public funds, there are things that you can't do. I remember there, you probably remember there was a huge controversy about ROTC on campuses when they discriminated against uh, gay students, and how colleges had to figure out, law schools had to figure out particularly how they were going to handle this, the possible loss of federal funds uh, if they did not allow recruiters onto campus. So all of these things are can sort of show you and show us that these are not totally private entities. These are entities that have a public face. and. Certainly, as in the past, with the Dartmouth College case, 
you think of religion as being the impetus for a conflict, we see now politics as an impetus for conflict here, not only just in private institutions, but in public institutions. I think the existence of these public institutions, things that were chartered by the state, sort of has obscured to some degree the extent to which private institutions are a hybrid. And when we think about interference now with, with, a, with the, uh, the governance of an institution, we think of schools like Wisconsin, for example, uh, with Governor Walker and his continuing battles with the University of Wisconsin at Madison, uh, largely for political reasons. It's not, you know, at Dartmouth it was a fight over religion, evangelicals, different understandings about religion. Today, in the public context, these public institutions, it's a battle about politics, largely partisan politics, Republican versus Democrat. It was alluded to today, uh, well, I think it was Akil said that that um, institutions, universities are seen as implacably liberal. And people who are outside of that see that as a problem and have tried to use and use politics as a way of reining it in, ensuring, I think I was reading the other day about a, uh, a proposal, was it at Texas maybe, to have syllabi posted or make them transparent so that people could see what was actually being assigned in classes and so forth. So members of the public, you know, it's bad enough to get your students to read the syllabus. Um, <laughs> difficult enough to do that, to think of people uh, making people read syllabi. But it, the whole point is to try to figure out, it, to sort of ferret out intellectual bias or political bias in these particular cases. And people say, look, I'm paying taxes for this institution, so therefore, I should have, I mean, we, I should have some say in the running of them. I should make sure that there is um, transparency, if there is equal access or equal uh, access to different ideas and so forth. So we are used to seeing that in the context of totally public institutions. Private institutions, for the most part, have escaped that, uh, although there are criticisms, definitely, but it's not, we're not seeing the kinds of actions, um, of the sort of interference that is, you're capable of having in the context of totally public institutions. So I'm not suggesting now as a person, as a graduate of a private institution, and also as a teacher in the private institution, as a faculty, of course, I'm not saying that I want to see private schools go the same route, <laughs> go the same way or being treated in the same way as public institutions. But I have a feeling that that might be coming more and more as people try to find ways to interfere with the running of institutions. We can have a talk about this. And I know as a faculty member, I have a particular per perspective on all of that, just as I would have wished perhaps in 18, the 18, 18, 1817, 18, 18, up until the, the founding of the, I mean, the, the ruling in Dartmouth College that people had left the college alone to do what it wanted to do, in a way. Uh, I wish that, maybe that today, that there would be much more, so suppose, respect and maybe trust. Maybe we can talk about whether or not we've earned that trust or not for faculty to run institutions in the service of educational, educational reasons, educational means, as opposed to politics. But I don't think that that is actually going to happen. We talked about partisanship, the great amount of partisanship that has affected all kinds of private, private institutions. We've seen that come to colleges as well. And I don't really see much of a way out of that. So, as we move to a place where education becomes central, become even more central to people's lives in the sense that you must have college degree or higher education to get jobs and employment and so forth, so forth and that's what people think everyone has to do, it becomes much more expensive, a much more expensive proposition. The government has to be involved in it. I have a feeling that we're in for some even more interesting times with professors, with students, with people who are in these institutions feeling that 
well, maybe not the students, but the faculty feeling perhaps besieged by the attempts to rein in or to interfere with the operations of, of, of these institutions. The Dartmouth College case remains iconic, both for its effect on corporations and for the way we think about public and private. But it's pretty clear, and I think Whitehead was right to this extent, that this is a question that has bedeviled us from the very beginning. What do you do with hybrid institutions? People are necessarily going to feel that they have a stake in something that they're paying money for. And we'll see this continue. I don't know. No, I, I'm optimistic. But I do think that this era of interference, as it was in the 18th century and the 19th century, will continue because of the amounts of money that are involved and the importance of the American institution to the future of this country and to the futures of individual students who come to these places with the hope of fulfilling the dreams they have for themselves. I'm not suggesting that faculty should be left totally alone, but I do feel that the people who go into this field, most of us, go with the idea of making a positive difference in people's lives, go with the idea that the purpose is to expand people's minds. I know that Yale perhaps may be more liberal than Harvard is in some ways, but I see on my campus a wide range of discussions among people. Maybe it's the law school. Maybe we have more conservatives at the law school than I do, uh, than we have at the, at the, at the, uh, at the college level. But I see hope in the American university. I think the people who come to us have the capacity to make judgments about whether or not they're being indoctrinated. It's very difficult to indoctrinate people. <laughs> you know, it's not as easy as you think. These are free-thinking individuals who have their own, the really smart people and the kind of places who come to Dartmouth and the kind of people who come, kind of people who come to Dartmouth and the kind of people who come to Harvard are really smart and are not capable I think of, of they're not being made into robots that we're indoctrinating. Um, the interference that people are by us as 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 teachers, I think, is not so great or not so nearly as powerful as the possibility that politics, that sole politics by legislators and others will interfere with the American institution of the university, which is a jewel in the crown of this country. There are two things that we do really, really well. Movies and universities. <laughs> Everybody come from all over the world wants to come here and learn. And I think whatever people feel about the university and how we need to be reined in, We've created something that is the envy of other people. And when we think about interference and we think about the purposes of institutions, whether they're private or public, what we have been doing has helped make the country the great country it was in the 20th century. And I just don't want to see that lost because of narrow concerns, like the concerns of fighting about whether who is going to be the head of the white church uh, in, the, in the 19th century. And we want to see that displayed at this particular moment when it is so crucial for the country to lead and the country to make the most of the talents and the capacities that we have in our students and in the resources that we have as this country. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, as a non-alum, I very much appreciate the invitation to participate in the symposium, and I also appreciate the warm welcome that I've received. Most scholarship on the Dartmouth College case falls into two broad categories. One category, written by law professors mostly, emphasizes that it provided the legal foundation for corporate freedom from government regulation. Another category, written especially by historians of American higher education, 
emphasizes that its legal differentiation of private from public universities promoted the transformation of American institutions of higher education, which, as Annette had just mentioned, had previously combined what later became identified as private and public features into structurally dissimilar private and public universities. This structural pluralism, many historians stress, continues to be a prominent and distinctive characteristic of American higher education. Ironically, relatively little scholarship has explored the implications of the Dartmouth College decision for the legal regulation of higher education, the context in which the case arose and the subject of my comments today. Drawing largely on decisions that cited Dartmouth College while addressing a fascinating variety of legal disputes at universities, I will focus on two related issues that remain vitally important in the 21st century. First, the extent of university independence from regulation by the state. And second, the extent to which this independence depends on the private or public status of the university. From the Dartmouth College decision to the present, courts have recognized that institutional independence from the state promotes public interests in education. They have provided more independence to private universities, but they have also recognized that in some circumstances, even public universities should be sheltered from the state that created them. At the same time, courts have identified state interests that justify regulation of private as well as public universities. The legal concepts used to analyze these issues have changed over time. The constitutional provision precluding the impairment of contracts was the primary conceptual tool in the Dartmouth College case itself, as you've already heard. With the ratification of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War, its prohibition against various forms of state action eventually became the doctrinal vehicle for differentiating public from private universities and determining their respective rights against the state. Judicial decisions in recent decades declaring that universities have institutional rights of academic freedom protected by the First Amendment have provided an important new constitutional barrier to state regulation. Fifty years ago, Henry Friendly, who you've already heard of, the eminent federal judge, used the 150th anniversary of the Dartmouth College case to propose a new interpretation of the state action provision of the 14th Amendment, <coughs> asserting that Justice Marshall's opinion in Dartmouth College drew too bright a line between private and public while construing the impairment of contracts clause Friendly suggested a more flexible approach to this distinction in determining the existence of state action. Following Judge Friendly's example in the context of state action, I will use another anniversary of the Dartmouth College decision to suggest flexibility in applying the First Amendment's protection of institutional academic freedom to public and private universities. It is a very significant, though often overlooked, feature of the Dartmouth College case that both the New Hampshire court and the United States Supreme Court, despite their many differences, stressed that universities require independence to serve their institutional function of providing education that benefits the general public. But the two courts disagreed about the sources of threats to university independence and that disagreement undoubtedly affected their legal analysis. The New Hampshire court viewed university trustees as the primary threat, with apologies to Annette and Kate here. <laughs> After highlighting the great social value of universities and, and the need to maintain their just rights and privileges, the court in New Hampshire stressed the problem about the unchecked power of university trustees. Higher education, the court reasoned, 
is a matter of too great moment, too intimately connected with the public welfare and prosperity to be entrusted to the absolute control of a few individuals and out of the control of the sovereign power. It warned that independent trustees will ultimately forget that their office is a public trust, will at length consider these institutions as their own, will overlook the great purpose for which their powers were originally given, and will exercise them only to gratify their own private views and wishes, or to promote the narrow purposes or a sect or a party. And I have to say, in my long years of working for the American Association of University Professors, I've occasionally come across some trustees like that. <laughs> Though most are excellent, okay. In contrast to the New Hampshire court's concern about independent trustees, Chief Justice Marshall's opinion for the United States Supreme Court viewed the legislature as the greatest threat to the necessary independence of universities. He referred to the pernicious influence of legislative bodies whose fluctuating policy and repeated interferences produced the most perplexing and injurious embarrassments. He doubted that private citizens would establish universities if their incorporation made them a public institution whose funds are to be governed and applied not by the will of the donor, but by the will of the legislature. Although they identified Dartmouth College as a private institution whose charter from the state did not subject its trustees to legislative power, Justices Marshall and Story agreed with the New Hampshire court that higher education is a matter of public concern. Story's opinion is particularly helpful because he emphasized the difference between what he called the popular and the legal meanings of the term public. He acknowledged that, in a certain sense, every charity which is extensive in reach may be called a public charity. It's in contradistinction to a charity embracing but a few definite objects. In this sense, he observed, a university is a public charity whenever it offers its charitable purpose of promoting learning and piety to a broad community. But he stressed that a public charity is often a private corporation. The assumption that because a charity is public, the corporation is public, he declared, manifestly confounds the popular with the strictly legal sense of the terms. In the legal sense, a public corporation means more than that the whole community may be the proper objects of its bounty but that the government have the sole right as trustees of the public interests to regulate, control, and direct the corporation and its fund and its franchises at its own goodwill and pleasure. That education is an object of national concern and a proper subject of legislation, Justice Marshall observed, all admit. Nor, he added, would anyone deny that the state could found an institution entirely under its immediate control, whose officers would be public. But he denied that Dartmouth College was such an institution, and more generally that all education is an exclusive function of government, making all teachers public officers, all donations public property, and the will of the legislature paramount to the will of the donor. Citing the Dartmouth College case, legal decisions throughout the 19th century addressed state regulation of both private and public universities by reiterating, elaborating, and extending the analysis in the Marshall and Story opinions. Decisions clarifying that state support does not in itself make a university public enabled many universities to benefit from the independence from state control conferred by private status by the Dartmouth College decision. Further limiting legislative interference in universities, decisions citing Dartmouth College maintain that subsequent ratification by a university's trustees cannot validate legislative amendments to the university's charter that are inconsistent with the provisions of the original trust. Occasionally, Courts indicated constraints on the power of state legislatures, even over public universities. 
especially when the charters of these public universities reserved various educational functions to the governing board. Yet decisions also upheld general legislation that universities challenged as illegal interference in their internal affairs, such as a licensing law, a law requiring gender equality in law school admissions, challenged by the Hastings College of Law in California, and a law prohibiting integrated classes, challenged by Berea College in Kentucky. By the late 20th century, state action and institutional academic freedom supplanted impairment of contracts and the law of trusts as the focus of litigation over how much the state could regulate universities. But lawyers and judges occasionally referred to the Dartmouth College decision to point out that many of the issues it addressed remained salient. Several decisions, including one by Judge Friendly himself, observed that the distinction be between private and public universities introduced in the Dartmouth College case was crucial in determining the existence of state action. Some of the factors 20th century courts rejected as indicators of state action, such as grants of public property and the public function of all universities, had been rejected as indicators of public university status in the Dartmouth College case and sub subsequent cases interpreting it. Cases analyzing the First Amendment right of institutional academic freedom occasionally cited the Dartmouth College case as evidence of the Supreme Court's long tradition of recognizing the importance of university independence from state control. These First Amendment decisions, however, have not addressed differences between private and public universities. So just as Judge Friendly used a previous anniversary of the Dartmouth College case to propose a more flexible interpretation of the distinction between public and private universities in, the, in defining the state action provision of the 14th Amendment, I will close by proposing a flexible application of the First Amendment right of institutional academic freedom that takes this distinction into account. In many circumstances, institutional academic freedom should protect public and private universities to the same extent. Yet I believe that on some matters that have educational implications, the state has more legitimate control over its own universities than over private ones, leaving public universities with less institutional academic freedom. So in my view, institutional academic freedom should protect public as well as private universities from legislation that regulates the content of teaching and scholarship. The classic early Supreme Court cases that identified academic freedom as a First Amendment right arose at state universities. They convincingly asserted that the First Amendment prohibits legislation requiring disclosure of the contents of a classroom lecture or interfering with the assignment and classroom discussion of controversial views. It is in this context that Justice Frankfurter laid the foundation for the First Amendment right to institutional academic freedom that Justice Powell recognized in Bakke, another case arising at a public university to justify for Justice Powell affirmative action. Frankfurter emphasized the dependence of a free society on free universities, which requires the exclusion of governmental interference in the intellectual life of a university. Legislation prohibiting universities from teaching evolution or requiring them to teach creation science should similarly be deemed violations of institutional academic freedom at both public and private universities because they preempt the expertise of faculty in determining whether a theory meets academic standards. Legislation that conditions research grants to professors and universities on the right of government officials to approve publication also violates the institutional academic freedom of both public and private universities. The federal case that raised this issue arose at Stanford, a private university, but the result should not have been different at the University of California, a public one. 
just as First Amendment academic freedom should protect some core functions of both private and public universities from state interference, some state interests are substantial enough to justify laws that constrain both public and private universities, even though educational functions might be affected. State interests in national security may justify laws that restrict dissemination of academic research that would reveal the details of military operations during wartime or how to produce dangerous weapons. State interests in public health may justify laws that restrict research involving toxic chemicals or endangering human subjects. State interests in preventing discrimination may justify laws that limit university discretion over student admissions and faculty employment. State interests in preventing fraud may justify state scrutiny of the educational claims of universities, public and private. More controversial assertions of state interests have arisen in connection with federal legislation denying funds to universities that restrict military recruitment and state legislation permitting concealed weapons in class, which I have to deal with in Texas. But the weight of the state interests in these cases, in my view, does not vary between public and private universities. Other state interests, by contrast, seem within the state's authority to regulate public but not private universities. State legislatures often fund various institutions of higher education with quite different goals and programs, including research universities, community colleges, liberal arts colleges, agricultural universities, and medical schools. These legislative decisions clearly limit the freedom of state colleges and universities to determine who may teach, what may be taught, and who will be admitted to study, which courts have recognized as key elements of institutional academic freedom. Yet no one has ever maintained that these decisions violate a public university's institutional academic freedom. And it is difficult for me to imagine convincing arguments that they do. A legislature's determination of the kinds of institutions of higher education and the extent of their funding seems clearly within its legitimate power. These arguments for legislative authority do not apply to private universities whose decisions about their educational goals and programs should be protected by institutional academic freedom from state interference. Some states require that certain courses be taught in their public universities. The Texas Education Code, for example, requires that all its public universities offer a course covering the United States and Texas constitutions and a course in American or Texas history. Imposing these course requirements clearly affects what may be taught. But just as the legislative designation of an agricultural university affects what may be taught without violating institutional academic freedom, I think the imposition of particular courses to promote the public interest in civic education is legitimate interest of a state legislature that does not violate the institutional academic freedom of a state university. The state interest in civic education, by contrast, seems weaker with respect to private universities, which should have more discretion in determining for themselves the values they wish to promote. Either in prohibiting or requiring affirmative action, I think a legislature should be able to regulate public more than private universities. Affirmative action raises broad issues of public policy that are matters of legitimate legislative concern. While I agree with Justice Powell that the institutional academic freedom of universities, including public ones, should include the right to make decisions about the educational value of affirmative action, I do not think a public university should be able to invoke this right if the state has legislated on the subject. No such legislation existed at the time of the Bakke case, and Justice Powell's opinion did not reach this issue. 
Subsequent cases have upheld state laws prohibiting affirmative action in public universities. And judges should similarly uphold state laws that require it. By contrast, because I think there is less public interest in the affirmative action policies of private universities, I would recognize their institutional academic freedom to make educational policy on this issue free from state interference. So examples could easily be multiplied, but I hope the ones I have given are sufficient to demonstrate that the distinction between public and private universities in determining their independence from the state, which was at the core of the analysis in the Dartmouth College case, remains significant 200 years later. Thank you. So my understanding is we have 20 minutes, and, and do we have microphones? Okay, so in an example of an institution evolving to meet current needs, uh, we're gonna have microphones for people asking questions, um, and we're also gonna quit punishing David for being tall, so we're, we're gonna stay here. <laughs> um, I got a backache. Yes, in the back. When was a state seat for a state official reserved or given on our board of trustees, and when did it ex officio become the governor, and why, and how did that work? I suppose I, don't, I should know the answer to that, but I don't. He's just always there. Um, <laughs> no, he or she was just always there. I'm assuming it's, when, um, they had state, they had college representation even immediately after Dartmouth College case, but I don't know if it was automatically the government. I mean, excuse me, the governor. So at the time of the Dartmouth College, go, go ahead. Thank you very much. Yesterday, mention was made of the episodes involving Harvard and Yale in unsuccessfully repelling efforts at early influence from Massachusetts and Connecticut. Could I hold, just, but were you going to answer, just a second. Are you going to answer the Dartmouth College? Oh, I'm, no, Are, no. are you going to answer the question? Sometime between the Dartmouth College case and 1890, <laughs> um, and I don't know exactly when, uh, but understand that that change in Dartmouth Charter uh, requiring that the governor be a uh, trustee was accepted by Dartmouth. It was not resisted. It was obvious, I mean, this is politics. And um, not so bad to have the governor on the board. Governor's a pretty important person. So, um, and, and that may have been Yale's thinking and Harvard's thinking the previous century. Uh, <clears throat> so the Dartmouth can change it, the composition of its board of trustees itself. Uh, and I, I think that's what it did. That was not a state law. Go ahead, Master Trump. Well, that in part addresses my interest, which is if one hypothesizes that Harvard and Yale have thrived and succeeded in subsequent centuries. Why is it the case that Dartmouth, in successfully repelling an effort at state inter interference, wouldn't have, uh, if the case had gone the other way, would Dartmouth University today be similarly thriving? Well, the point is it would be very different. I mean, what, uh, Governor Plummer was a very smart guy. He had private correspondence with Thomas Jefferson for decades about uh, progressive education, we would call it today, I guess, or just non-sectarian education um, and science. Uh, and if the nine new members of the board had come on in 1817 <clears throat> and had stayed on, uh, we, and then we had this board of overseers appointed by the governor, it would have been a different curriculum, a different university. Would it have been good? I think, yeah, it would have been good, yeah. Um, I, but I also think that leaving it to the will of the donors, past, present, and future, and to the original trustees has resulted in a pretty darn good place. Over here. 
just curious, I think uh, uh, this is for uh, uh, Professor Raban. Um, in distinguishing between public and private institutions, do you distinguish between the leverage of the federal government to um, create mandates and state level government to create mandates? Because of course the federal government is well known for using its power of the purse, so to speak, to uh, force all sorts of behaviors on multiple institutions in society. States may have somewhat less leverage in their own jurisdictions. How do you think about those two levels of oversight? I guess my thinking is affected by having been a faculty member at the University of Texas for 35 years, and we have a lot of work keeping, excuse me, keeping the state legislature at bay, and I think that's true of a lot of other public universities, and that was mentioning the University of Wisconsin. Uh, so I would say, I'm thinking back on my years of experience with the American Association of University Professors. Overall, I would say there's more interference from the state legislature, which is closer to the university than from the federal government, but there are plenty of threats from the federal government as well. The case I was referring to about submitting information before publication grew out of a federal regulation from the National Institutes of Health, which said we will give you, Stanford, a grant to work on uh, a new device for hearts, but you have to show us the research before you publish it, Stanford refused it won. I think, as I said, the University of California should have won too. That's an example of federal interference. But short answer, interference comes from both sources, federal and state. Um, Professor Amar. On Kate's uh, observation about University of New Hampshire or Dartmouth University um, controlled by the government versus um, Dartmouth College controlled by donors, past, present, future, and, and the trustees, here are two interesting little factoids that might put this in, in some perspective. Here's the first factoid. You, you take a look. Um, this is about cr um, the creative destruction of um, um, capitalism, the churn. You take um, just how dynamic our economy is. You think about the, the great, um, the, the biggest, um, the most successful corporations in, say, 1920 versus 2020. There's no overlap. Um, Google, Amazon, Facebook, um, uh, uh, Microsoft, um, um, uh, uh, they didn't even, um, Apple, didn't really exist in 1970, and now they're behemoths, uh, whereas Consolidated Can, American Tin, you know, all, all these companies uh, um, from 1920 d don't, don't exist today. So, so the regular economy has lots of churn, but actually universities are pr and colleges, are pr which, as Annette said, are among you know, uh, uh, America's really great um, uh, world-leading uh, sectors, along with uh, movies, she, she said, um, uh, uh, there's very little actually difference. The, if, you, if you ranked the greatest colleges and universities in 1920, and you compared them to the greatest colleges and universities in 2020, very little difference, actually. Um, uh, the rise of a, of a few places, uh, Stanford, uh, University of Texas, um, but, but um, now, um, um, uh, and, and of the, the top 100 um, uh, entities, um, uh, um, uh, industrial entities, only 10 or so overlap. Uh, um, uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey and California become ExxonMobil or things like that. Um, so only 10 of the, of the corporations are the same, whereas only 10 of the universities are different. But now here's the point, at the, when the Constitution's adopted, there are basically nine institutions of higher learning, the seven oldest Ivy League schools, everything except uh, Cornell, and uh, William and & Mary and Rutgers. Those are the seven at the time of the Constitution that are, that are chartered. Now what's very interesting though is um, seven of them basically stayed private, the, the seven oldest Ivies. Two of them basically went public, William and & Mary, 
um, and Rutgers. And the seven that were at the top in 1789, they remain, according to US News and World Report, seven of the top you know, 14 schools in America. The, the um, uh, public schools have drifted down a little bit. I mean, they're still very impressive. Age counts in, in education. The older, the better, like money. You know, the older, the better. Um, but, um, but, the, but private has out, if you just step way back, private has outpaced public in, 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 in certain ways, which connects to, to Kate's point. Um, we have great uh, uh, sectors in both um, public and private, but, but the private has done very well. The gentleman in the back. Thank you. <clears throat> We've talked a great deal about state and federal government interference. We've talked about debt. We've talked about grants. I find it interesting, and I guess the other part of the question is, those in Great Britain that made their first donations to uh, Occam to build Dartmouth, did they get a tax break? <laughs> they, do, they do now. And my question is, how has the federal government, state, and local government's ability to tax public and private institutions affected and created their development? Do we have a volunteer? <laughs> well, a <clears throat> couple of points. First, um, with the rise of the income tax in the United States and elsewhere in the world, obviously, uh, I, uh, when a contribution is deductible and is paid with pre-tax funds, uh, that helps every charitable organization that qualifies for uh, the, such donations, um, <clears throat> churches, and schools. Uh, there's recently been a big change in the US tax code. By doubling the standard deduction, um, many people um, are not gonna itemize deductions, and we'll see what happens to donations to charitable institutions. Um, I agree with Annette that that's a subsidy of charitable institutions that the government can give or not give. It's not required by the First Amendment. I don't think it's required by um, academic freedom or anything else. It's a policy decision. And that, that is one important source of funding of charitable institutions. Uh, I was thinking more about taxes that the institutions are forced to pay because the, the burden of the tax can affect what the institution has left to run their program. Again, this is a policy decision. It's not a constitutional decision. Uh, and our states and federal government have, by and large, said this. All uh, property that is used for the educational mission of the college or university is not taxed. Not public and private, right? Pu public and private is not subject to, for instance, even property tax. Um, but <clears throat> the facilities that are not, and there's a line drawing problem here, that are not part of the uh, educational mission may be taxed. So Yale's golf course is taxed. Um, and the income from the golf course is taxed, but not the income from the dining halls owned by Dartmouth. <clears throat> um, that's considered, people have to eat, I guess, in order to read and learn. Um, but I, I don't think this is a constitutional question. It's still an interesting question, a very important question. And we are fortunate that um, uh, states have not exercised their full powers to tax our, in, our institutions of, uh, and, and churches. Just a footnote to this, since all of you graduated, most of you, I assume, graduated from a private college, I, I don't know if you're aware of the enormous extent these days that state universities are dependent on private funds. Mm -hmm. So at my law school, I think a minuscule fraction of the budget comes from state funds now. You, in fact, Texas, University of Texas has the second largest endowment in the country, right? After Harvard? I have to see current oil prices to know the answer yes, to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Depends on that. I mean, just to exercise the moderator's privilege for a minute, I mean, I think that raises a question. It, it, Dartmouth College is a case about a state trying to take a private university public. The issue of the day, I think, is public universities going private. Yeah. The number uh, of 
of universities have, have you know, seen their state contributions go way down. Sometimes there's a quid pro quo where there's less interference in exchange for less contribution, so less of an in-state requirement, for instance, mm -hmm. um, less regulation of what tuition can be charged. Um, I'm curious what yeah. the panel thinks of that. Is that positive, or, and should it have well, legal implications? Well, it's, it's, to my mind, not a positive thing because it's disinvestment in the public sector. Again, back to what I'm saying, you, the UC system, Michigan, UVA, all both schools have gone to uh, Michigan, maybe like two percent of something that um, is is private now. It's mainly public, so it's like we have chosen as a citizenry not to pay for public education, and it's it's good that people have stepped into it. But what it means is that these public institutions are really, really strapped um, for funding, and this is, I mean, this is again what I made the country great. I mean, the educational system, the, the GI Bill, people coming back, being able to go to Berkeley, being able to go to those places for not very much money because they were subsidized and now that's over. So it's made everything much more expensive. Just to elaborate with a specific example of Texas, when I started teaching there in 1983, I think the yearly tuition was $1,000. I had a student my first year of teaching who was from Michigan and his in-state tuition would have been higher at Michigan than the Texas tuition at the time. So we got students from all over the country. There was a limit how many we could take. But basically, Texas provided a free education for everyone. And it is moving to hear the alumni come back and say what a difference mm -hmm. having an essentially free education at the University of Texas has meant for them. They couldn't have become lawyers otherwise at the law school. No longer true. Today, I think it costs I don't know, maybe $30,000 in-state. Okay, For out-of-state, it's about the same as Harvard. Harvard yeah. uh, it's a tragedy. And it's the result of state disinvestment in higher education, not just in Texas, but around the country. And as, as the bad thing, I'll just add to this. Think about these people who are saddled with debt what it means for the millennial generation to start out with debt that's the equivalent of a mortgage for a house that you can't buy, and how that affects everything. It's a trickling effect. You know, it's a, it's a um, cascading effect is what I really mean. So yeah, it's, it's a real thing to think. I mean, I like private education, and I came here and so forth, but there ought to be room for high quality, low cost state education to educate our populace. We've got to compete with the world and uh, this is a really serious, important thing. On, on the other hand, I, I've taught at the University of Texas and at Duke University, and I don't have the sense that our law students were going into public interest and public service in a significantly higher percentage at UT than they are at Duke. And so we ended up subsidizing a ton of people when tuition was low. We subsidized a ton of people who became wealthy partners in law firms. And it's not the most efficient way to run that subsidy. The question would be, would some sort of income-based repayment or loan forgiveness program across the board be a more efficient way to do that? I think it's a, it's a, it's a you know, I, I loved the idea of making it easier for people to make those other kinds of choices. Um, it's not clear how often it had that effect. There's a lot of other inducements going on. Any, anyone else? Yes, Professor Masters. The effect of college administrations in limiting the freedom of speech. And I'll give you an example that happened right here on the Dartmouth campus. As many of you know, I have been specialized for a long time in the political implications of modern biology, which is, by the way, a crucial issue that you're not discussing, but in terms of research, too. Because in terms of research, our universities are very often the key global institution in scientific and technical education, and it changes a lot of things. But I had a conversation on a street corner that since I'd worked on the connection of biology for politics, like you decode the genome, who owns your genes? 
Don't expect a scientist to answer that, a political scientist ought to. I found myself called into the office of the dean of college. I didn't know why. He didn't even inform me according to the rules of the college. Formal objection to me that I'd had that discussion on campus. The dean decided with the challenge. And actually, I was punished by not being allowed to make any further grant applications through the college or to teach at the college. Well, I'd retired, I could, but I was doing independent study things. At that point, of course, I said to hell with it. I didn't care because <laughs> I've got enough of a status. I don't have to worry about that. But if you don't realize that the question of whether the college teaches genetic engineering or trains people in issues because they say they don't like it, and it's the college or its administrators that do that, this is a serious issue of freedom of speech, which we, is practically a very important thing that we should consider. Would you have represented him, David? Absolutely. Absolutely. He might have, David might have represented you, but if you were already retired, I don't think he had any rights. It would be under state, it's a question of state law, and New Hampshire Supreme Court has recognized <clears throat> rights of tenured professors and pursuant to the terms under which they're hired. Um, but it, it's also, uh, professors have lost their share of cases, as have students. In, and what I think you're raising an extremely important point. Um, I know you think it's all constitutionalized, um, but not all the state courts agree. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think right in retirement, I had, among other things, three years of consulting with the Department of Defense, uh, another big grant. I brought in, uh, I don't know how many hundred thousand dollars in indirect costs to the college. I mean, they just didn't give a damn about anything, law or anything else. They were, they were just scared about having a student complain. Well, I think it's important to recognize that every actor in the picture can be a threat to freedom of thought and freedom of expression, not just the state government, not just the federal government, not just the board of trustees, the college administration. As a professor in the classroom, I have to be very careful that I'm not discouraging people from voicing particular points of view. But the truth is my students are more intimidated by each other than they are by the faculty. And, and so they can be a limit on, on free expression too. So uh, we have to watch everybody. I mean, one of the basic conditions of American Constitutional law is paranoia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are at the end of our time, alas, but thank you. Um, if you can help me thank our panelists.